Steelhead, or lake run rainbows, are found throughout the Great Lakes region of the U.S. and Canada. It's a chance to catch a very large rainbow trout on the fly. Yeah, sometimes the rivers are crowded, and many of these fish are hatchery raised. But access to these great fisheries is available to anglers in populated areas with most rivers open to the public. And with the right timing, the opportunity to cast a fly over vast numbers of large fish. Oh yeah, nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly. You're going to have to try it just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery. I grew up on the shores of Lake Ontario and um, when I was a kid, we didn't know anything about steelhead. We had heard rumors that there were, there were rainbow trout that came in from the lake and came up the streams to spawn, but um, the trouble was the season was closed September 30th when the steelhead come in rivers and um, opened April 1st after a lot of them dropped back into the lake. Steelhead are found in hundreds of tributaries to the Great Lakes, from huge rivers to tiny creeks. Some of them even run through major urban centers. There have been small runs of steelhead in Great Lakes tributaries since rainbow trout were introduced from the west coast of North America just before the turn of the 20th century. But populations really expanded in the 1970s with massive stockings in the Great Lakes at the same time that the Clean Water Act began to improve water quality in the lakes and their tributaries. There's a really exciting fishery that happens every spring and fall in nearly every tributary stream to the Great Lakes. They're big rainbow trout that grow fat in the lakes and then come up these streams to spawn. Now, some people call them steelhead, and some people say, no, they're not true steelhead because true steelhead are a West Coast fish that comes in from the Pacific Ocean, comes up rivers to spawn. We're not gonna get into that argument here. I don't care what you call them. We're gonna have some fun, we're gonna catch some steelhead, and we're gonna learn how to do it. Oh, yeah! All right, a jump. So, Jeff was fishing down there in a little bit slower water, and I always like to fish a little bit more towards the head. Um, I think the fish are easier to catch. When they're in the faster water, they're easier to fool. They have to grab it quicker. And um, this fish, it didn't take him long to, to grab that, uh, that white zonker. Yeah, fairly, that's a heavy, heavy fish. Steelhead fishing's all about timing. You know, these fish come out of the lake, they're coming up here to spawn. Um, they can literally move 10 miles a day. So it's all about getting to the river when the fish are in. And you can never predict it. it the river could be full of fish today and it could have been empty last week or could be almost empty next week. So it's, it's all about timing and you just have to go and hope the fish are in the river. You know, when you're fishing for migratory fish like steelhead, where conditions are so important, you've got two options. You either are flexible, you make your phone calls, you check the internet, and you go when conditions are perfect. Or 
you take what the river offers you. And that's what we have here. We've got, we had high, really high water. It's dropping now. It's almost fishable. It's dirty, but we're here. We're going to fish. We're going to have fun and we're going to make the best of it. So we're here on a smaller steelhead stream, a tributary of a larger river. And um, I'm here with Jeff Blood, who grew up in this area and knows this fishery intimately. And I want to talk a little bit about how you read the water, because where you put your fly is the most important thing, right? Absolutely, Tom. <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're fishing an indicator rig. I'm fishing tight line, but we're both trying to do the same thing, and we need to fish the same water. No, exactly. <clears throat> and it's, uh, you're trying to get over the fish and then down into the fish. So what you're looking for as you're coming up the stream is the sweet spot of where they want to be in, in the current or as they're migrating, um, they really come up and stop and rest. Yeah. And then they move on up until they find gravel. And then they'll move on to the gravel when the temperature comes up and the water conditions are correct. So before we look at the water, what do they want? What what is steelhead? What, where do they want to be in the in a river? Well, you know the basics of almost any animal is food, love, and shelter. Yeah. So they're coming here for the love. Right. Uh, they're not ready for the love yet, but yeah. they're preparing for it. And then they want food and shelter. Because they're coming from a very large body of water, the Great Lakes in this case, where they're uh, they feel safe most of the time. Mm -hmm. They're coming into a small system and they're big fish. They're mostly looking for shelter first, uh -huh. and then they're looking for food. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this particular section of the river right here where we're standing, um, there's a long riffle going up through. Right. And down below us, there's a long riffle. Mm -hmm. So they've come up through the long riffle. This is a natural stopping point for them. For them to rest a little to bit. To rest a little bit. If you look at this water, Tom, uh, it's got, you know, nice current coming in, yep. but it's not too heavy. Right. So they're not expending a lot of energy to mm -hmm. stay here. They drop down in. There's a ledge over there. So they like structure. They like rocks like is in the water right here. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it's just a soft drift coming down through. Perfect place to hold them. And you want to spend a little more time on this type of a pool than you might on a you know, another smaller, lesser pool as you go up the stream. Because it's a bigger, for this river, this small stream, that's a pretty good right. sized pool. This is, it's a pretty good sized pool. And they want to be in the current, right? They don't want to be off in the real slack water. They like most to have of, some current. Most of the current. time, <clears throat> the fish, you'll find uh, always an outlier, you know, that'll go over and lay sure. against the bank slow. But yep. the majority of the fish want to be in the current. This has got a little swirl to it. Uh -huh. So sometimes they'll be laying you know, the, the opposite direction of what the stream is flowing because the current's swirling around through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to take that into consideration as you're making your drift and sometimes let it come back on you. Mm -hmm. And you do it either with an indicator <clears throat> or as you're doing with a straight line technique. Mm -hmm. And a straight line technique right here is a really good spot because you can get right over them. Right, yeah, small. Pendulum swing get right close down to over it, the yeah. top. Yeah. All right. There we go. I think it's a steelhead. Yeah, we got a nice steelhead here. So he was laying right in that the soft seam right there. <clears throat> and there's uh, you know some good structure in a ledge right down there, just a perfect place for him to be. And uh, it's not a particularly huge fish, but it's a nice fish. So I caught him on a, on a white zonker, and I find that fly to be particularly effective, especially on the Lake Erie tribs. And what I believe it's imitating is uh, an emerald shiner, and particularly a dead emerald shiner, which uh, th the reason why it works well is, you know, there's natural mortality every day out in the lake, and the fish feed on the dead ones. A lot of people don't know that, but they do. So this looks like a nice little male. 
you can see that white zonker in his mouth. You can see my, uh, my egg pattern above the fish. Uh, so I fish a tandem rig. Just, you know, gives you twice the chance of catching the fish. And I'm gonna bring them over here and see if we can land them. And, uh, Whoop. And he's off. Structure and protection for steelhead does not just mean rocks or logs. They can feel just as safe in deep water or in riffled water because the broken surface hides them. But wherever you fish for them, remember that they won't be far from that main current. Oh no! <laughs> Yeehaw! Yeah! Yeah, you know that. It just looks so good over there. Was it's overhung? It's got. Uh, oh, I didn't see that stick. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Oh, he's got me wrapped around it. Oh, I, he's free, but yeah, he's free. Thank you. I didn't see that. Um, okay. Yeah. As I was saying, I was over there against the bank, and um, there's a nice overhang there. There's a stick hanging over there, and the, you know, the um, the current looked just right. And uh, you know, the, these steelhead do like do like to have some protection, as Jeff was saying. So um, that's a pretty fish, huh? Pretty bright. Ate the white zonker again. Would be a wild fish, I don't know. Hard to tell, but pretty fish anyways. Whoop. Bye bye, buddy. Ah, woohoo! <laughs> so I came up, I came up on this fast, water here and I noticed the soft water on the inside where that where that whirlpool goes around and uh, I thought maybe just ahead of that swirling whirlpool where that big foam thing is where those bubbles are coming down there is a nice soft edge it's relatively deep in there and sure enough second cast there was a fish in there and now we got to get this fish back she's way on the other side While I was doing all that talking, the fish got away from me. <laughs> so I think not really a good place to land him in here. I'd like to be below him. So, you know, pulling a fish upstream is always tough. The hook's gonna pull out. So I think what I'm gonna do is try to run downstream and get below him so I can get him into a little bit slower water too. So I'm gonna get in the water here and uh, and uh, try to get below them and get in a little bit better landing spot. So now we've got this nice shallow water, softer water, we can get them in easier. I'm gonna try to get below them again. Nice fish. Oh, and he ate the egg. This fish ate a fly that was uh, given to me by an angler who's been doing well with it. It's a yellow, yellow, big yellow yarn egg fly. And uh, I gotta go over and thank him for that. Well, there he is. Pretty bright steelhead. Gave us a good fight. Oh, look at that, he's got both flies in his mouth. What a pig. Give him a drink. Whoa. When you're dead drift steelheading, so much of it is about the drift. It's, it's critical that you get that fly down near the bottom and dead drift without drag. And sometimes just moving a few feet up or downstream can change the way your fly drifts. And the side of the river you're on can also be important. I've been trying to fish this pocket on the far bank and Jeff's been over on the other side catching steelhead. 
I'm stubborn, I'm trying to do it from this bank, but I'm casting over faster water and I'm just not getting the drift right. So it's just, it's just all about positioning. Sometimes just a few feet can make a difference. As with most types of fly fishing, but especially when fishing two flies, as we are here, there's always a chance of getting hooked. Here's a quick way to remove a hook on the river, as long as it's not in the eye or in really soft tissue. Those instances are better dealt with by a trip to the doctor. So we've got a, uh, we've got a little issue here. And um, Mark, when he was tying on a fly, got a fly stuck in his thumb. So we're gonna show you how to, how to pull out a barbed fly. Of course, barbless is always better, but if you don't have barbless, then you gotta do this trick. So you take a heavy piece of monofilament, this is 1X, and you run it around the bend of the hook. There, All right, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pull on three, okay, ready? One, two, three. Wow, it didn't even hurt. There are two basic methods for catching Great Lakes steelhead, dead drifting and swinging the fly. Although swinging the fly is thought by most to be more fun and closer to the essence of fly fishing, dead drifting a fly is often the most effective and is the best way to start if you just want to catch a steelhead on the fly. There are many different ways to get a dead drift, which is bringing your fly to the fish instead of a fish chasing the fly. Some steelhead are more aggressive than others, but the majority of the fish are down in their lies, picking things from the current, just as smaller trout do. And as in trout fishing, any drag on the fly may turn these fish off. So your fly has to tumble in the current like natural food. And also like trout fishing, we can do this either by suspending flies from an indicator or by fishing them on a tight line with a direct line from the rod tip to the flies. On a recent steelhead trip, Mark Melnick and I both dead drifted a combination of egg flies and white zonker pet. Although we used exactly the same flies, we used different techniques to get them down to the fish. And we caught about an equal number of fish when we were able to get good drifts. Here Mark and I explain the difference in our techniques. As you can see, Tom is using a very different technique for targeting these steelhead than I am. He's tight lining with a cider which means that he's in direct contact with his fly uh, and the weight that he has to get his fly down to the bottom. I'm using an indicator, which uh, is not unlike a bobber, um, which shows what's going on beneath the surface for me, but I don't directly feel what Tom feels. So it's two very different ways of presenting eggs and, and nymphs, um, and they're both very effective in their own right. You know what, to each his own. Tom loves the sensitivity of being able to feel those fish take or to feel the bottom. And I like the action of seeing the bobber go down, the indicator go down, and setting the hook on these fantastic Great Lakes steelhead. So what I'm doing is called tight lining or high sticking. And what I'm doing is I'm using a very thin line and it's all leader. The, I really only have the leader out, outside of the tip of my rod. So you plunk the flies down, whether it's weighted flies or a split shot, they go right to the bottom. That thin line that they're connected to doesn't have any resistance and it cuts through the current, gets right to the bottom. Then you tighten up a little bit and just try to lead those flies down through the pockets. It's, it's dead drift and you've got just a little bit of tension on it so that you can feel every bump on the bottom and maybe a little bit more solid pull that might be a fish. Whoop, bye bye buddy. Yeah, I just re-rigged, I just re-rigged and um, maybe something about the way I put the weight on there. I, I lengthened my, my tippet a little bit. It, it could have been a lot of things. Um, with, this, with this high sticking, you want to have a lot of tippet below that, below that cider. And um, I didn't have as much tip it on before and I can that allows me to get that you know the tippet is going to sink better than anything because it's thinner so the more tippet you have on there the quicker your fly is going to get down with less weight 
Rigging for tight line steelhead is very straightforward. You tie about a 2 foot section of colored cider material to the end of a 9 foot 0x leader, add a swivel to the end of the cider, and tie a fluorocarbon tippet to the swivel. Your tippet might be anywhere from 2 feet to 5 feet, depending on the depth. You can fish a single fly on the end of this, or tandem flies where legal. Split shot can be placed above the flies or between them to get added depth. There are many ways to set up an indicator rig, but here Jeff Blood details exactly how he sets up his indicator rig. Show us how you rig an indicator for steelhead indicator rig and then show how to adjust it because um, I know myself included I get lazy and everybody gets lazy and you don't adjust your your indicator height or your weight and then you're you're not bouncing bottom or you're not at the correct positioning so uh, how do you start this so I'd, indicator I'd, rig? I'd, I'd be glad to show you how Tom okay. and you know that is probably one of the most important things is to adjust uh, <clears throat> for the conditions that you're standing over right. and as you move up and down the stream it yeah. changes yeah. okay yeah. or from day to day your yeah. weather system changes you get more water mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like to use a egg-shaped indicator. Um, for me, it just floats better. It's got good uh, aerodynamics for casting. Okay. And I like mine in line. Uh -huh. So what I mean by that is I'll show you as I put it on. So you're starting with a, just a 9 foot 3X <coughs> trout leader, right? Standard Standard 9 leader. foot 3X, 9 or 10 feet. Okay. Uh, what I find is that seems just to be the optimum length Mm -hmm. for at least Lake Erie steelhead fishing okay. and probably all of the Great Lakes mm -hmm. uh, from my experience. But anyway, uh, I just bend the line over right. and I feed it through. Bend the, the leader over. The leader, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. And, and uh, feed it through. Right. And now you got a loop sticking through there. And okay. then you take your tag end yeah. and feed it through that loop and okay. just pull the whole system all the way through. Uh -huh. And then you tighten down. Now okay. what that allows so you to that do doesn't is, slide. It locks if you notice, in it's place. locked in, and mm -hmm. it's when I say in line, you can see how this it's um, proportioned all the way around. So right. it's not a pendulum flopping around or whatever. Yep. And I, I just find that works better, especially in the wind. Okay. Now if I want to adjust that, yeah. Um, you know, I just back it off. Back off. Well, I'm just pulling the... pulling the the line through. Right. And then I just draw it down, and now you can see I've moved that down a foot. Okay. Okay. And, and I can opposite, move it all the way you down. You want to bring the it back up? It's just, just right. I can so. move it all the way down the system. Okay. Now, uh, often what I do is I'll put a swivel right uh, where the tippet material starts on your leader. Okay. And the reason I do that, a couple of things. Um, in the fall of the year when all those leaves are in the system, yep. and you hook a leaf and the wind blows it and you get a helicopter effect and mm -hmm. it just twists your line. This makes it go away. The other side of it is when you're tying in your tippet material, it's a better junction, especially if it's fluorocarbon and you have a nylon leader. Okay, so, so you start with a standard nylon leader sta and then fluorocarbon right. tippet. And fluorocarbon tippet. Okay. And that's what I fish. So it's a straight three X off the swivel. Three X. Okay. And then I go to my my fly and I use a tandem rig. Okay. And I use a uh, improved clinch to this fly. Okay. <clears throat> And so there's there's a system, and okay. then so there's an egg fly mm -hmm. at the end of the tippet, mm -hmm. and then below that you have what? I have a white zonker. Yeah, <coughs> with how much tippet? Same in the well, same I three do, X. I do the same three X. Okay, because um, people are going to ask these questions. You know, they want to know exactly two and a half what you got. To three feet. Okay. That's okay. A long I know that's dropper. longer than what people would think it uh -huh. should be, but that's. Yeah. What I've learned, it catches fish. Everybody wants to know why. I'm not really sure why. Uh -huh. It just catches more fish. Okay. okay. Enough for me. So <clears throat> on my split shot, yep. um, I carry three different size, B, BB, and 3 aught. Mm -hmm. And what I find is I can, on almost every system, accomplish a lot. So this is a BB right here. Okay. And I'll put it about 14 inches above. Then I'll add two, three, four of those, or I'll put a three-odd on. Now, why why are you doing that? And here's, here's How the far? Thing. That's about like eight inches from your... That's nine no, inches that's right ten, there. So it's, ten, it's, ten, it's, ten, it's, it's about tw 12 inches from, right there. From you know, the I'll fly. vary it, you know, 
anywhere from 10 to 14 inches. Uh, <clears throat> now, probably the biggest mistake most people do is they break off. They continue to break off. And as they're doing that, let's just say you're losing both rigs, you're probably losing two or three inches every time you yeah. tie a fly. Right. And all of a sudden now they're down to seven feet or eight feet of, of tippet. Yeah. I'm not gonna tell you you can't catch fish with that, mm -hmm. but it really impacts it. So the you, more fine fluorocarbon you got in the water right. column, the less right. resistance and, and that against length, that There's tippet. something about that length mm -hmm. that just seems to be magical. So, you know, eventually cut it back out, put a new piece of tippet material in. Yeah. Tie two and flies on. Tie two flies on and get back to it. Yeah. Your split shot is, you know, you're measuring the variables, which are the depth, the speed of the water. Right. And um, so what you want to do is you want it to, like, bounce, but you don't want it to drop and hang up. Yeah. Okay. If you're not feeling the bottom, the likelihood that you're down on the bottom where the fish normally are is not very good. So, so if your bobber is your bobber, your strike indicator isn't twitching every once in a while, you're not deep enough. Well, the reality is it is a bobber. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is so a we fly fishermen call it a strike indicator. I call it a bobber. And it's a, it, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's very effective. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so in my fishing, I also will um, high stick with my indicator on my line. Mm -hmm. People say you can't do it, and I say, why not? Okay, so often what I'm doing, and it has to do with your distance, you understand this. When you're high sticking, it's normally off the pendulum of the, your rod tip, maybe a little farther out, and you're letting it come down through. But if you have to cast 30 or 40 feet across the stream, yeah. it's very hard to high stick high and stick. be accurate yeah. over there to do it. This gives you that flexibility, uh -huh. so I can Flip it over there, you know, if it's in a place where it's, I can't wade into it to get there so to high stick. So you can mend and I can indicator. mend it and do it, and it just gives me more flexibility. So when do you when do you adjust your indicator? What what indications are there that oh I should make my indicator closer to the to the flies and the weight or farther away? So this is probably the least um, adjustment that I will do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But most of the time I'll go deeper. Okay. Uh, when uh, I'm not seeing the tick of the line, <clears throat> and I'll and I'll pull it all the way up close to the top, you know, within about two or three inches of the of the leader. Um, but there are times when I think the the water is really slow and the tail out of a pool. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the the you cast it out if the leader's too long, your indicator's going, but it hasn't straightened your leader out yet so that you actually see the detection. So if you shorten it down, the detection will happen quicker, and especially when you're in a tail out, that's a good place to do it. So you're, you're gonna probably adjust your weight before you adjust your indicator height? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. so that's the first line of defense is the adding a split I do shot in, or in taking off a split shot if you're hanging up too much. If my length is correct, that's the first variable before okay. I even change my flies. Okay. Whether you use an indicator or tight line system, you will hook the bottom and you will lose a pile of flies. No way around it. When you have a snag like this and you know you're gonna to have to break it off, it's a really good idea not to break it off with a high rod like this because if it breaks off at the fly and you've got some split shot on there, the split shot can come flying back at you and hit you in the face or or your fishing partner next to you. So a good idea, if you're gonna to have to do that, is to put the rod under water and then back up or pull on it. And that way, if that split shot gives way, it's not gonna go anywhere, it's not gonna come at you. Ooh. You can manage this fishing with a nine foot rod for a seven or eight weight line especially in the smaller streams. But a better option is to go to a 10-footer. That extra foot holds line off the water, which is important regardless of whether you're fishing an indicator or using a tight line method. Steelhead returning from the ocean may or may not feed. The answer to that question is subject to endless debate. But there's no doubt that Great Lakes steelhead feed on their spawning run as their bodies don't need to make the physiological adjustment from salt to fresh water. Steelhead eat aquatic insects, bait fish, and at the right time of year, 
eggs from other steelhead, and from Pacific salmon. Wherever you go, be prepared with some larger trout nymphs, egg patterns in various colors, and streamers. But most rivers have their particular favorites at different times of the season, so do your homework before a trip and visit the local tackle shop to get the latest info. And never pass up the offer of a fly from a generous angler who's more successful than you are. Man, I forgot how cold steelhead fishing is, so just make sure that you dress warmly, dress in layers, use hand warmers, and wear gloves. Don't be like me. Next, we'll explore a more elegant, and most of us think more fun, way to fish for Great Lakes steelhead, traditional swinging techniques. Swinging flies for Great Lakes steelhead came late to the game. Originally, on East Coast rivers, angler tried traditional West Coast steelhead techniques with shooting heads and sinking lines. But because many of the rivers were smaller and not conducive to swinging, fishing egg and nymph patterns became the norm. But then this technique, borrowed from West Coast steelheading and European Atlantic salmon fishing, became more popular in all sizes of rivers. Modern two-handed rods and lines, plus the bigger flies with flowing motion popularized on the West Coast, became a lot more popular. There's a fish. Fish. Yep. There you go. Swinging is considered the most fun and the most pure form of steelhead fishing. While day in and day out, it may not be the most productive way to catch steelhead, in the right situation it can be productive, and it's far more interesting and exciting. Swinging involves getting the fly down to the level of the fish, but slightly above them, and moving the fly past the fish in an arc, not too slow and not too fast. It's a great way to cover more water than dead drifting a nymph or an egg. And the strike is more exciting because the fish often take the fly with a violent rise as it seems to be getting away from them. You know, John's been urging me to start out short and we got into this run. We haven't touched the steelhead all day and I start out with a very short line, let it swing around, bang, steelhead. So always start out short and fish that water directly in front of you. Listen to your guide. And listen to your guide. <laughs> <laughs> I can manage it, I'm not that old. You're getting there. <laughs> my legs are short, that's my only problem. There you go, that's why I'm helping you out. Oh, okay. Thanks. I wanna see a high rod, okay, Tom? You got a lot of big rocks. Yep. We don't want that leader getting around the rocks. All right, so no side pressure until he gets in close. No, sir. Okay. Good plan. <laughs> Unless he comes to the surface, then you're gonna roll your rod low, okay? Mm-hmm. He or she, do we know? It oh, it's like, a, well, it's a he. It, is it? It looks like a, <laughs> I have like no a female idea. to me. I have no idea, man. He was 100 yards away from us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you can start doing your side pressure. All right. It's not a big fish, but a beauty, though. No. Oh. Yeah. Nice. That is a nice fish. Like, it is. And yeah. it's a but. It is a he. It is. It's a he. <laughs> Bigger than you thought, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice fish. Mm, pretty, pretty, pretty. Fish. Right in the corner of the mouth. Beautiful. Look at that. Wow. But the anticipation of sudden pressure on a swinging fly is electric especially after making hundreds of casts without a strike. How you set up to swing a fly depends on water flow and depth. The more you angle your cast in an across stream manner, the quicker the fly swings, which is important in slower flows where the fly might swing too slowly. Angling the cast in a more downstream direction decreases the arc of the swing and slows its progress across the current but it also does not allow the fly to get deep enough in some situations. Getting a fly down to the fish is important. One way is to vary the density of the heads you use. So when you cast to the far side, there's a rock shelf over there, it's quite shallow. Normally you would bump on that, mm -hmm. right? And then I would say, hold your rod back, it'll pull the fly off of that and we drop it into the trough. But you haven't touched anything over there. 
So that to me is just a good indicator that the fly is not getting down deep enough. The other thing is the angle of the line on the water. So if you have more floating line going out ahead of the boat, downstream from the boat, right, and it's, it's staying up high for a greater length of time, that's telling me we're still not getting still deep. Still not pulling it yeah. down. So, so the, if I was here without you, I would know that I'm not getting deep enough because I wouldn't be every once in a while ticking bottom. I'd feel a little hesitation. Is yeah, that what so I would do? Those are the indicators that you would look for personally. Mm -hmm. So the first one would, would be, yeah, if you actually put a cast a little higher upstream, you should be ticking bottom right away mm -hmm. or very, you know, as soon as your line's in there. The other one is that the length of line that you have out that's still elevated high in the water. Those are the things that you look for. Okay, so that's what so, you look you look for. Some of that floating running line going down to get in. down underneath. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Sounds good. All right. So we're gonna put a gonna put a sinking head on here. Go to the next. This one is a this one is called This End Too Real. Is that the <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> So we're in a deeper, a little bit faster run, and John didn't feel like my fly was, was swinging deep enough. So we went from a head with a three to five inches per second sink rate to a seven inch per second sink rate. So we've gone to the heaviest head that I have in my arsenal. Let's, um... Let's do, let's do a quick change, Tom. Let's put a fly on there with a bit of weight to it. Okay. Another way to increase depth is to use a heavier fly. Sometimes going to a fly with lead eyes will get you deep enough without the bother of changing lines. It's a smart idea to have popular swinging patterns in both weighted and unweighted versions. Besides the angle of your cast, mending and how you follow the fly's progress with the rod tip can affect your swing. Yeah, the other thing you can do is a couple of slack line mends. That'll push it down as well. So whenever the, the fly is under tension, the fly will ride higher. If you want to drop a fly in deeper on a longer line, we can introduce just some extra line, slack line mends, right? So you throw a couple of slack mm -hmm. line mends into it. Right. And then let that pull out and the fly will go down deeper in the pool. John's been explaining something to me that's, a very, I think, a very subtle part of swinging a fly, and that's after the cast and after making a couple mends, pull back on the rod a little bit, which helps slow down the fly swing speed. John, you want to explain exactly what you're, what you're, what you're getting at here? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons that we do this. Number one, uh, you made a cast a few minutes ago where you laid it out, the, loot, the, sorry, the leader kind of hooked around. Mm -hmm. And what I did was, after I let it swing down to about a 45 degree angle, mm -hmm. I said to you, just pull back on your rod a little bit. So what that does- You mean you, my casting's not perfect? It's not perfect all the time, <laughs> but you're close. You're really close. But uh, what that does, if your leader is actually hooked around in a circle like this, mm -hmm. what you do when you pull back is you actually allow the time for the leader to turn and straighten, mm -hmm. and then you follow it down through the pool. Okay, yep. so you've actually repositioned the fly more into the manner that I think the fish would like to take the fly, mm -hmm. which is kind of that straight up stream approach, mm -hmm. right? So it looks mm -hmm. like the fly is actually swimming upstream. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one. Secondly, when you make a cast, if you allow the belly of the line just to swing over like this, mm -hmm. it's actually pulling the fly across. Right. Okay, if we throw an upstream in and you pull back the rod, you actually turn the fly again. Now the leader is hanging straight down off your rod and you've slowed down the presentation. And as you push your rod forward, it allows the fly to go deeper in the pool, but still in that, that upstream facing manner. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? So it's very simple. They're very subtle movements, mm -hmm. but as long as you are making that right presentation, because it's all about presentation of the fly to the fish. Mm -hmm. And as long as you continue to make that right presentation, you're covering the water effectively, it's gonna produce. Okay. Men. Now just hold back a little. Right now, follow, and just use the current speed as the judge. Okay. As, or you judge by the current speed as to how fast you're going to follow that fly through. Okay. You can be a little bit slower than the current speed. The fly will ride up a little higher mm -hmm. on a tighter line, but it also pre presents the fly slower. 
Two-handed rods are a lot of fun and you can cover a lot of water easier. But um, in some waters, you might want to use a single-handed rod. Maybe it's all you got. That's fine. Uh, I have a 10-foot eight weight here and it's a, it's a floating line on there. It's a, um, it's a Scandi line, but you can use a standard nymph line. And then you put a polyliter on the end. This one is a 10 foot, seven inches per second sinking leader. And then you just tie a tippet on the end of there and put your fly on there. And you can fish very easily with a single handed rod as well. The single handed rods are best in small streams where you don't need long casts. A 10 foot eight weight rod is a good tool for this, although in smaller rivers where you don't need to keep as much line off the water, even a nine footer will do. So if you're fishing a single handed rod, you can use a standard floating or sink tip line, floating line usually with a uh, poly leader. You can also use a Scandi line and then you can practice your two handed casting. You can do these two handed casts like a snap tee or a double spay with a single handed rod, it's not that hard. In big water, where it's a struggle to get your fly into position because you can't wade deep enough, or you wanna cover more water in a single cast without struggling to make long casts, a two handed rod makes longer casts and drifts much easier. These rods run from 11 to 13 feet long. The shorter, lighter rods are good for moderate rivers where you don't need really heavy sinking heads to get down. In very large rivers, a 13 foot rod or longer will make it easier to cast longer distances and these bigger rods will support casting extremely heavy sinking heads. What kind of conditions are best for swinging? Aggressive fish willing to chase a fly are always better, which often happens with fresh fish in the fall. Water temperatures in the 50s and 60s will make cold blooded steelhead more active but once cold weather sets in and the fish become lethargic, it becomes more difficult to take them on a swung fly. It can still be done in cold water, but your fly must be close to the bottom and not swinging too fast or steelhead won't bother to chase it. So all you're doing is providing the fly to the fish in a really good presentation. Mm -hmm. You're allowing the fly to come down through the river and you're hoping that you're creating an opportunity for a fish to take it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about, yeah. right? And if you make it anything more than that, you're adding difficulty to it. Mm -hmm. So it's very simple and it's and so on. And then the other thing that we're dealing with is we've just had a crazy water temperature drop here. So we've just dropped about four to five degrees. Mm -hmm. Fish are cold blooded. Their metabolism slows them down and also the requirement for food goes away as their metabolism drops. So with that upstream men holding back the rod, it's a slower presentation and it allows them more time to actually see and grab the fly. Mm -hmm. And as long as your fly patterns are something that's attractive to them, you're hoping that they're gonna grab them and eat them, just like you just accomplished. So mission accomplished, way to go, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank well you. done. It was fun, it was great. Any day you catch a steal, it was a great day. Again, in the spring when waters warm up and fish are dropping back into the lake after spawning, a swung fly can be very effective. What kinds of water types are best? More uniform flows make it easier to get a good swing, so look for long sweeping runs, riffles, and tail outs. Broken pocket water and water with many swirly currents make it difficult to catch steelhead on a swung fly. Although it can work there if you plan your strategy so the fly swings properly in just the right little pocket. Listen as John Valk explains why he had me fish various places on a day of swinging for steelhead. John, why are there, why do you think there are fish in this pool? Okay, so what this is, you've got a very nice run here. Mm -hmm. And if you look downstream, you can see the faster water. It's quite shallow. Those fish are going to, they're, they're migratory, obviously. Mm -hmm. So they're going to migrate up through this, into this part of the river, and then they'll slowly move up through this run to the head of the pool, which again, it picks up fast, shallow water. So when they get there, especially if it's a bright day, they'll turn back and come back into this pool and hold here. So this is, this is a run, but it's a holding area, you know. And <laughs> it's a holding area because it's got deeper water. Deeper water is a deep trough. And some rocks. Exactly. 
So you have structure in this pool that are gonna, that's gonna hold fish. You have the deep trough down the center and you have a nice even current speed, right? This is that really nice soft, you know, they refer to it as walking speed current mm -hmm. that makes swinging a fly so easy to do, right? So that way you get a nice presentation of the fish and then hopefully you're gonna light one up here in about two seconds and it gives us a nice big pool to fight them in. So John, why, we're fishing a, a, just a little bucket here. Right. Um, why are the fish in this spot? I mean, it's a big pool. The current looks about the same. Uh, it's a little bit slower over there, a little bit faster here. Why are the fish right here on okay. this side? So first of all, fish like to swim. Yeah. And they like to be in water. Uh -huh. So that's why they're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, if you look downstream, You've got this big, long, flat piece of water with a nice, even current in it. Right. And what happens is on the bottom of the river, there's actually a depression or a, a just kind of like a channel. Mm -hmm. It's a deeper trough that comes up through. Mm -hmm. And it's the shape of the trough. So way down there, it's going to start almost dead center of the river. And then it comes up the middle over here. And then it actually kind of comes off to the side. And right here, we have a depression in the bottom of the river. So that depression might only be a foot or two feet, Tom, mm -hmm. but it's enough to hold a fish as they're migrating up the river. They can hold here for just a, a little while. You know, might be a few minutes. It could be a day or two. Mm -hmm. But quite often, I get to these little depressions. We put a run a few casts through it, and guess what? There's another one there. So, John, why did, why did we stop here? We've got a big, long pool. I mean, it's, what, 200, 200 yards long? and it all looks fairly uniform, why did we stop in this particular place? So just like the other pool that we went to, there's a little depression in the bottom. Mm -hmm. We have the, basically the same idea here. The, the depression in the bottom is a little bit larger, but we've got some really big boulders. Yeah. And if you look just downstream, Tom, just downstream of the boat, like 15, 20 feet, you'll yeah. see some swirls in yeah. the water. Uh -huh. That's the current, be, the hydraulics being kicked up off the boulders. Okay. The fish okay. will be sitting in those boulders. Okay. And then they'll bust up into the next run. Okay. Okay. So if I if I was here by myself, would I be able to find this water? Not not knowing what you know, would I be able to an experienced steelhead angler? Yeah. Once you've put the time in, uh -huh. absolutely. And, and okay. so they they'd look for that you that kind of walking speed. Exactly. They'd look for some boils on the surface to indicate there's some roughness on the bottom. Yep. Exactly. So you have that, and <clears throat> there's a couple of other givens that you'll always have when it's a brighter day. It's not so bright today, but right. the water where you have the depth will mm -hmm. always be a little bit darker. Darker, yeah. So you're looking for that darker water. Okay. You're looking for anything that could give you a sign of an obstruction on the bottom. Right. Or any kind of structure where a fish will hold. Okay. 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 Swinging flies come in many types, but the most important aspect of a swinging fly is that it has mobility in the water, so that it looks like something alive trying to get away. Flies can be as small as an inch long or as long as four inches long, and in every shade from black to white and every bright color in between. In general, use smaller flies in clear and shallow water and bigger flies in fast, deep, or discolored water. So we got that fish by changing flies, right? We were using black. Red and black. Red and black, yeah. and we went to black and purple, and they were both the same weight. Yeah, exactly. The same weight. Uh, we did drop down a little bit, so we were fishing a little bit different water, but so you, you right. never know, right? You never know, there's so many variables. Um, but it, it looks like the uh, purple and black, and it's a beautiful sparse, but weighted fly that, that gets down nicely, yeah. not having a lot of uh, stuff to to no, retire exactly. it, sink rate just gets right down with those with those lead eyes and uh, yeah. So the way what I do, Tom, is I have a series of patterns and they're all almost all identical, mm -hmm. just different colors. Mm -hmm. They're only tied with marabou. Mm -hmm. Just marabou. So yeah. you and hold, a little flash. Yeah, and you hold that in the water. That stuff flutters. Yeah, there's a lot of movement to the fly. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we moved down through this pool systematically. I just finished telling you that there's a rock ridge out there. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want you to run that fly right on that ridge. You mm -hmm. made the perfect cast. You put it right on the ridge. I said, you're right on it. Boom, you yeah. hit the fish. Yeah. If you decide to chase steelhead with a two-handed rod, you really only need two casts to get the job done. 
Let's get a lesson from Pete Kutzer on those two casts and also an easy way to shoot line with a two-handed rod. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer with the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today, I want to talk to you about casting two-handed rods and a couple casts that are going to get you fishing up of both sides of the river very effectively. Those two casts are the Snap Tee and the Double Spay. The Snap Tee and the Double Spay will get you fishing in just about any river where you can swing a fly. The Snap Tee, we're going to start with our rod tip downstream, and a lot of times you're set up with your rod across your body. Whenever you make any spay cast or two-handed cast, we want to be aware of wind. If I have wind coming downstream, and I set up to cast off of my shoulder right here, I'm a right-handed caster. With this wind coming in this direction, I risk the chance of hooking myself in the back of the neck. So I'd want to set up my cast downstream, and we can do that with either of these casts. But let's take a look at this snap tee first. With this snap tee, I'm going to start with my rod tip low, downstream. I'm going to take my rod, and I'm going to move it in a circle and come back to where I finish. Right here, here's a big clockwise circle. Now I'm back where I finished. By doing that, that's going to take our line and set it up upstream where we can get that good anchor point and set up to deliver that fly. After we make that snap, we're then going to sweep our rod around, climbing, getting it into our good forward cast position. Once we're here, now we can deliver our fly. Again, I start with my rod tip downstream. My rod's kind of across my body or my arm's going over my body. Here's that circle, right back to where I started. Now I can begin that sweep, climbing, climbing, climbing. Now I can deliver that fly out to my target. Take your time with a lot of these casts. It's gonna be nice and slow. That's kind of the spade casting mantra. Keep everything slow, keep it easy. But if you practice this cast, I'm sure it's gonna help you catch a lot more fish. The double spay is a really fun cast to use. And in this situation, I'm set up perfectly. A lot of times when you're set up for that double spay, your rod is gonna be downstream away from your body. We're gonna take our bottom hand, grab the bottom part of this grip right here. We don't wanna grab the whole rod like this. Just a nice gentle grab right around the bottom of the grip. My top hand, I'm gonna hold the rod very, very gently. And you'll notice when I make a lot of these casts, I keep my grip very, very light, very loose, and very relaxed. And that's the key to good casting. We're gonna start with a nice, easy flop. I'm gonna take my rod, lift it up, and I'm gonna cross my arms right here. Notice my rod tip came down. What that did was that pulled the tip of my line, my poly leader here or tip, or even just a regular leader, if you were using a single-handed rod, it pulls it a lot closer to you. That's gonna help set you up for that nice sweep, bringing the rod around, where then you can make that delivery out to your target. A common mistake I see is getting a little too aggressive with that flop. If I get a little too aggressive, that throws my line upstream, and now when I sweep this rod around to make this cast, now that line's around my body, I could potentially tangle myself. So when we make that initial flop, nice and easy. Nice and easy. We're just pulling this line a little bit closer, trying to get it in this good anchor position. I'm gonna make this nice, easy flop, and now I'm gonna sweep my rod around. When I sweep my rod around, I'm just turning my hands. It's almost like you're spinning a steering wheel right here. I'm sweeping that rod around, but then I have to climb this rod up to get into that good casting position. Let's take a look at a double spay in real time. Nice, easy flop. Sweep the rod around, climbing. Now I can make that delivery right out to my target. That's the double spay, and it's a great cast to get you fishing in a lot of different positions. A lot of people ask me, how do I manage my running line when using a two-handed rod? There's a lot of different ways out there. I find this way to be pretty simple. What I like to do is I like to cut that length of running line in half and hold it underneath my pinky of my bottom hand. Right now I have 10 strips of fly line out, so I'm going to cut it in half. So there's going to be five strips that I'm going to hold here and then five strips that I'm going to let sit loose. One, two, three, four, five. That's half of this running line now touching the water. I grab that line with my pinky, and now I can strip again, holding on to this line. One, two, three, four, five. Now I have my running line in my head right outside the tip of the rod where I needed to make that long cast. Now I take this running line, and I'm gonna rest it over the bridge of the reel, and then hold it with my bottom hand. The weight of that head is gonna keep a little tension on this running line, keeping it 
rested up against the bridge of the reel, and now I can make this nice cast. By doing this, I have a lot less line in contact with the water, so it's gonna be able to shoot a little bit easier. When I go to make this cast, I can set my cast up, make that delivery, and that line fires out pretty nicely, pretty quickly, and pretty effortlessly. If I strip all this line in, and hold that line right there on the water, and then wrap the line underneath the reel, and I go to make this cast, even with a good cast, that line came off very, very slowly. There was a lot of tension with that water holding onto that line. Give this a shot, and I'm sure it'll help you shoot a little more line. Just cut that length in half. You can do it with three strips and three strips, six and six, seven and seven. I've even used 10 strips and 10 strips. That's a lot of running line to manage, but I think it's a pretty easy way to do it. There's one final piece of advice I can give you when swinging flies for steelhead. Don't set the hook like you would on a trout, dry fly, or nymph. If you do, you'll just pull the fly away from the fish. Lousy cast that was. That's all right, Tom. You can get fish on lousy casts. <laughs> they don't all have to be pretty. <laughs> Wait until you feel the weight of the fish, then just tighten up, hang on, and enjoy the ride. There's a fish. Fish. Yep. There you go. Ooh, that coming at you. Is he coming coming at, at you. He's there. He's still there. Nice. Oh, you go, yeah. Nice deal, <laughs> there, buddy. Nice fish. Beautiful. Lower your rod a little when he comes to the surface, okay? okay. Only when he comes to the surface. If he's taken off, you can you can raise your rod. Yeah. But as they come up to the top of the water, I'd mm -hmm. like you to roll a little to the side. Okay. Um, a high rod when they're taken off is great because of boulders of rocks mm -hmm. keeps your line up out of it. Play them a little lighter, Tom. All right, all right. I'm gonna back the boat over towards the bank here so I can get out and net those fish for you. Yeah, I want to get out too. I'm not. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I tend to be heavy-handed. Yeah, don't be heavy-handed. All right. Right? We really want to show off the fish of this river. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Love that pull after after all those casts. What, did you make 20 casts? <laughs> you know, I made more than that, man. <laughs> made more than 20 casts. Easy, lighten up on them. Jeez. Uh, we got 16 pound out there, man. It's not going to go get off. Are you worried about the hook pulling I'm worried out? about the hook pulling oh, out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, right. you know, especially if they're hitting a little bit light and yeah. that look like a light take. Yeah. So we call those skin hooks. Uh-huh. Right, where you don't get them in the mandible, you actually get them in the front of the mouth. Yeah. And that hook can pull out, right? Okay. So. Nice. Whoop. Hey! Beautiful wow. buck, Tommy. Wow. Awesome, Thank man. You, Way to go. Thank you. Way to go. When you set the hook on that fish, that was one of the best hook sets I've ever seen. Well, I didn't set the hook. Exactly. That's the thing. Exactly. I get a lot of guys who try to rip the fly back. Yeah. Yeah. And the best thing to do when you're swinging flies, especially when you're dealing with sink tips, you feel the weight of the fish, lift the rod slow. That's it. Yeah. Whether you call them steelhead or lake run rainbows is irrelevant. These big forms of rainbow trout are some of the most exciting fish on the planet. They don't always come easy, but they're always worth the effort. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Adipose Boatworks. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. Oscar Blues Brewery. <laughs>